everyone, happy Thursday. I'm Helene and welcome to Virtual Veg Fest Live. Pretty excited about today. Well, you know, if you watch weekly, I'm always excited about our live talks. So it just gets better and better every week. So first let's say thank you to the Plant Based Network as we are powered by them and to our gain for sponsoring our lives this month. And of course, have you entered our raffle copter? You have a few days left to win prize packs from our gain, follow your heart, Hodo Foods, and our gain, Hodo Foods, Crafters Organics, and our gain, and, and follow your heart. That's it. <laughs> There's four of them. Thank you to them for donating their pr pri monthly prize packs to us that we can give to you just for like doing some nifty stuff, like liking your social media. Our Pass the Buck campaign is also ending this month with donations for Blind Spot Sanctuary here in North Carolina. So if you can make a donation to them for every dollar you donate, you'll get entered to win an Orgain prize pack as well. And I already know who February is going to be, but I won't tell you that until Sunday. So you want to pay attention on Sunday to know who our next nonprofit will be. Well, we have Sergeant Vegan today, and I met him in Atlanta because I go down to Atlanta and I MC their second room. And I get to meet some really cool people, and this is one of them. So you're going to hear some amazing stories. He writes books. He, he well, military, thank you for your service, and, and more. So I'm going to bring him on so you can learn all about Sergeant Vegan, Bill Muir. Hey, Bill, how are you? Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. I'm so glad that you're here. I was like, you know, I think about who to reach out to and I kind of go back to like, who have I met and let me go <laughs> find these people. And you were probably going to be part of our in-person events because when I met you, you were like, I want to go to every state. And I was like, I have Tennessee and I have North Carolina. And you're like, well, I haven't been to those states. <laughs> Not, not with the, not with what I'm doing, trying to go and speak and advocate for the animals in every state. Uh, but I've been to those states before. Uh, once the pandemic is over, which hope, hope, hope it's soon, I will get back to my uh, vegan agenda, actual in person. Right now, it's all virtual, as obviously everybody knows. Oh. I yeah, I know. <laughs> it directly impacted. So everyone, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to write them in the little box and we'll definitely address them. But for now, can you please tell everyone who you are, what you're about, and just let's hear it. Sure. I'm Bill Muir, aka Sergeant Vegan. I've been vegan since 1992, which at the, this moment is 28 years. Well, let me see. I'm a combat veteran, registered nurse, I'm an author. I wrote the book Vegan Strong, and I've recently released a, a children's book called The Adventures of Sergeant Piggy, which is a lighthearted book about, as you could guess, a pig and saving animals and, and wonderful stuff like that. Uh, I belong to a vegan strength team called the Vegan Strong Team, and I work with veterans. As a veteran working with veterans, it's, it's kind of cool. It feels like, uh, feels like family. Not always in a fun uh, Hallmark movie kind of way, as you would guess, a lot of our veterans are going through rough stuff. Uh, and also, as you could guess in a pandemic, it's also a, kind of a rough thing to do. But I would rather be spending my time doing something I thought uh, worthwhile than, than fiddling with widgets or whatever kind of jobs people make money at these days. Yeah, so I have, I always look at your website and you want to do this like vegan traveling thing, right? And I want to hear more about that. Sure. <laughs> Me sure. personally, I want to hear more about the traveling part because that looks so, like actually, yeah. So before I started uh, writing, I was very slowly trying to go to every country on the planet. Right now I'm at 47 countries. It would be, be I stopped obviously right at the pandemic. It would have been much more convenient to have had 50 and then the pandemic happened because the 50 sounds much better. Uh, it wasn't from lack of trying that, uh, you know, obviously the pandemics happen and what are you going to do other than do the best you can? Uh, I was stationed abroad and I lived abroad even before the military. I lived in Japan for eight years, Italy for a couple of years. Obviously, uh, being deployed, I, I lived in sunny Afghanistan for a year as well. Uh, and I, I love traveling. I think the world is an exciting, awesome place. And once, it, once 
things open up again, I can't wait to get back on the road and, and see more of it. Yeah, it's really, it's really cool because you want to go and highlight all these restaurants and places. Cause I, I mean, on your, on your website, you talk about vegan treats, which yeah, yeah, is, is a favorite of mine <laughs> and it is, it's not in the most convenient place. <laughs> well, it is. So what a lot of people don't know, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that other than me and you, most of your uh, listeners are not going to know what vegan treats is unless they're from the Philadelphia, New York area, but it's Philadelphia, and New York, about three hours apart and vegan treats is right in between them. It's in the middle of nowhere. But if you think, hey, how would I be able to send food to both Philly and New York on a daily basis? That's the spot to be. And if you if you go to all the you know vegan spots in New York and, and some of the Philly spots and are like, whoa, how did you get this wonderful you know peanut butter bomb or something like that? Then and, and that it probably came from vegan treats and where where I we coined the phrase by we I guess me but vegan road trip and back in the 90s is we would drive out to vegan treats or to sticky fingers have you been to sticky fingers mm -hmm. uh in DC does it still exist it's been a, a hot minute since I lived out that way but, not only uh, does it exist but they actually opened a restaurant too what yeah there's I, I can't remember off the top of my head maybe someone watching and remind me the name of the restaurant they opened and it's not called sticky fingers but it's by the same chef so hmm. they open a restaurant in addition to separate location well i might have to check that out when i'm back on the <laughs> east coast but yeah that's that's uh what the vegan road trip is about i think a, a secondary reason why i love traveling and filming it and talking about all the vegan stuff is just the idea that people have that you can't be vegan doing this, that, or the other, uh, or people will say, even in California where I live, they'll say, oh, being vegan is too difficult. And I think anything that helps chip away those ridiculous notions where people say, I can't be vegan in, in California, I'll say, well, I, I could literally stumble and fall on a Carl's Jr. where they have the Beyond Burger, or there's a veggie grill down the street, or Pizza Hut has Beyond Meat, yep. or, and I keep going, and they'll be like, well, what uh, What if I now create this crazy like vegan desert island with the pig story or <laughs> that could translate into if I was traveling and I'll say, well, I've actually been to and as someone who's been to a good chunk of Europe and Asia and some and a little bit of Africa in the Middle East say, well, you know, OK, you want to ask we to talk about Italy. I've been to Italy, Italy, Spain. Uh, I'd almost get. We'd almost get tired and run out of time if I went through the whole list. Uh, and it just it makes it more difficult to have that argument. And I think people are looking for it. People who don't want to go vegan because they have this perception that it's difficult really want to grasp on to every and anything they could come up with other than that they're lazy, uh, which change does take a little bit of energy. And we have to admit that and, and acknowledge that. But being vegan as someone who's vegan, you know, is anything but difficult. It's just once you get the ball rolling, you stick with it because you're like, ew, why would I want to, you know, if I pass a dead squirrel on the street, I'm not going to be like, hmm, let me just sample that. <laughs> Even if you eat meat, you're not going to think that. And it's the same thing if you walk into a restaurant and someone's busy hacking up a, you know, a cow or a pig or whatever. Yeah, that would, <laughs> that's, un that's unappealing. Going back to like vegan treats. They oh, have, whoa, whoa. they have a gluten, I'm gluten free, but they have a gluten free rainbow cake that mm. is for the peanut butter bomb is the bomb. But yeah. the, the gluten free rainbow cake, because it reminds me of rainbow cookie mm. is incredible. It's hard to find, but they do ship. So plug for vegan treats. They do ship <sighs> and they do make chocolates. And for Valentine's Day, they have like this heart with like really cool chocolates in it and, and you know, for Halloween, they have something. They make a vegan Twix too, but it's not always on their menu. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so, That's, so that, it, <laughs> I it would be the drool. <laughs> if they, it would be deadly if I could get their donuts here. I, you know, that we have a Voodoo Donuts. Have you been to Voodoo? Mm -hmm. So Voodoo has, for those who don't know, Voodoo Donuts is kind of a quirky, cute uh, donut shop, and they have a couple. It's it's slowly becoming a chain. I don't yep. think it's gone much farther than Colorado. It hasn't. But, yep. but it's it's up my way. And now, about an hour from me, they have a Voodoo Donuts. And they have a vegan Boston cream called the Portland cream. It's deadly. I don't want to be anywhere near that spot. I 
you know, as someone that spends a good amount of time working out and caring about what, what shape I am and how I look and how I feel, you know, vegan junk food, as much as I love it, is deadly too. Uh, we didn't have to worry about that back in the day. Uh, <laughs> back in the early 90s, e even before vegan treats or whatever, vegan junk food might be like, like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich where the junk is the jelly. Uh, <laughs> tofu, you know, or, to, or, or tofu, <laughs> uh, but but it's just gone to such a a, a next level that I I want to uh, keep, steer clear of that if I can. Yeah, a vegan bake a bakery open ten minutes from my house Ooh. here in, in Wake Forest, North Carolina. It's the, called the Plant Cakes Bake Shop. It's an organic plant based bakery. I was there yesterday. I came home with a cake. <laughs> It's very so, deadly indeed. It, a six inch cake, but a cake nonetheless. And a donut and three muffins. So new business, great people. I Question. <laughs> filled donuts or cake or just regular cake donuts? I have I got the cake donuts. They're all cake donuts because they're not frying. And I've got the gluten free ones, but I got a gluten free muffin for me and two glutinous muffins for my boyfriend. And the cake is gluten free. The cake is incredible. I didn't mm. intend to buy a cake, but you know, it was support. <laughs> you know, I mean, he'll eat most of it, but it's so good. So if you're mm. ever around here, we don't, that's our first 100% vegan bakery here in the Triangle in North Carolina. So wow. it's, and it's 10 minutes from my house, which is really a blessing and a curse. <laughs> yeah, that's a blessing and a curse. I agree. I'm, I'm in, I'm in the Valley in California. And luckily, other than that, Carl's Jr., there's nothing there's nothing that, ah, well, again, it's like a 10 minute drive. That having to get in my car on a day off, if I'm trying to be lazy, will luckily pr protect me from that stuff. Except I usually go where I go to the gym. There's a, there's some stuff around there, but nothing as incredible as a bakery as you're describing. Right. Thank goodness. <laughs> I, believe me, I know. So you're an athlete. I guess you could say that. I, I don't think of it in the same way as when I, you know, I wrestled in college briefly and I ran track in high school. I, at that point, I guess you could say I was an athlete. And, well, I did, I kickboxed uh, out of college. And when I was doing Aikido full-time at that point, I would say that I was probably more of a an athlete. Now I'm just a dude that goes to a gy the gym uh, consistently because, uh, you know, I think vegans as one of my one of my many little parts of the philosophy of being vegan is if you want people to go to do what you're doing, you have to make it look good. And if you're out of shape or, you know, back in the day, we had this that people had this concept that vegans were emaciated uh, hippies, more or less. And I did see a lot of emaciated hippies that called themselves vegan. So when people would say, well, uh, you don't look vegan. They're saying you don't look like an emaciated hippie. Yeah, of course I don't, because that's the you know the reason why people put those two things together is not that vegan equals emaciated hippie. It's that emaciated hippies were becoming vegan, <laughs> uh, and the hippies, to be fair, because a lot of some people have given me a uh, flack for my uh, my dissing on the hippies. To be fair, for years it was just punk rockers, like former punk rockers, like me, or the hippies that were doing it. There was no anybody else. And then uh, after moving to California, I found out that some of the yoga people were vegan as well. But it was just then punk rockers, yoga people, and hippies. So the hippies have been uh, holding it down, and I, I believe uh, hippies were responsible for "Follow Your Heart," which is amazing. So you got to got to give love and respect to them uh, for that, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I want you to talk about being vegan in the military. Sure. Sure. That, that's mean... a that's a pretty hard seg <laughs> uh, segue from uh, from me talking about the hippies. But <laughs> but yeah, it uh, as you can guess, I'm, I'm very far from being a hippie, but <laughs> Jokingly, while I was in the military, everyone would call me a hippie because, <laughs> you know, anything but I want to stomp your guts out is hippie to, you know, if you're if you're with the infantry or something like that, then. And honestly, I guess I agree with that. Being a, a medic in the military is kind of a, a hippie thing in, in a way. 
Uh, so I joined the military after 9-11. I was living in Japan for a solid seven, eight years. And then 9-11 happened and it hit me pretty hard as someone who was an expatriate, someone living abroad, seeing your country attacked, but from like a complete half around the global way, it, it was crushing and it, it, it meant that I, I felt like I had to do something about it. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I think the same thoughts that would make someone like me want to be vegan in that, oh, there's animal suffering and, and uh, awfulness in the world. I want to do something about it. I want to at least not contribute to that. When I saw our country being attacked and I, I looked a couple steps forward and saw, oh, we're going to be going to war and this is going to be a thing, obviously. I thought, well, I could do what my other liberal friends are doing and sit at home and yell at the TV and, and do some some angry uh, uh, hand uh, gesturing. Or I could join the service. I could I I thought that I would make a better medic than an 18 year old because at that time I was 28, 29. So I had life experience. I cared. I wanted to help people. And. In my mind, I thought, well, I would probably be put in situations where I would be able to help both the locals who were the unfortunate participants in, the, in this awful play or uh, local, my own soldiers. And as things panned out, it, it was that. I, I spent more of my time with locals and wrapping burnt babies and stuff like that than I did uh, with my own soldiers, thank goodness. And uh, that, that's the abridged version. Oh, you can, you can go. I want to hear everything. So sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that prompted me. What uh, what what kind of questions uh, was it? Uh, I guess we could go into how was it being vegan in the military, that kind of thing. So yeah. it instead of a it was awful, it was great. Instead of that kind of um, like binary thing, it really depended on where I was, who I was attached to and what I was doing. So weirdly it was worst being vegan in basic training in fort benning georgia and it was best being vegan with the 173rd airborne but in garrison in italy uh as have you been to italy yet i have yeah Not it's as amazing vegan, as vegetarian. well it's actually pretty okay i would say maybe like i would scale it back from amazing but it's pretty freaking good even if you're vegan, to be in Italy. Uh, I was probably the only person I know that was kind of getting chubby, still running five to seven miles a day with mandatory training and the training I was doing on top of that because I was eating a pizza a day. They had a place that had uh, soy gelato, so I would get two, a kilo of soy gelato a week, and I would eat two and 2.2 pounds of, of soy gelato. I would get this big... Because I I thought, well, you know, I I had known what it was like to be vegan in basic training. So I was thinking I better put on the pounds now because I'm going to lose them once I go to Afghanistan. And in the beginning, I was I was right with that idea, but I was able to figure it out. Uh, so I guess go back going back to vegan and basic training. Basic training is not meant to be easy. Anyway, that's the your processing into the military, you're being indoctrinated into, into that, that lifestyle, if you could call it that. Um, there were a lot of difficult parts to just being in the military and basic training and like getting used to the whole, like, this is life now. Uh, I'm no longer an individual. That kind of thing takes a while. But as someone who's vegan, you know, having to accept that I'm no longer going to eat anything that I enjoy. And from at that point, I was, you know, I was still able to go to like vegan treats or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, forget all that. Your, you know, best case scenario, PBJ, worst case scenario, like two pieces of bread and lettuce and tomato for a meal. Maybe I'll put rice on it. So, uh, you know, things that you would just say, that sounds gross. In my mindset, I was like food equals fuel, fuel equals survival. Taste is a second or a third kind of consideration. So... Like, let's say breakfast. What would I have for breakfast? Well, uh, I did not know at the time, but it turns out that I, I believe now uh, oatmeal at our dining facilities or defects, as we call them, is vegan if you just get it by itself. Uh, I'm not sure if they changed that or if it's always been like that. I just assumed that it was milk and butter and whatnot. 
but anything in the food line would have was just straight up animals. So as everyone knows, cornflakes, while not necessarily nutritious or delicious, is vegan. So I, w I started off eat eating dry cornflakes for breakfast, and I did that for weeks. And after a while, I was like, okay, how can I make this not necessarily more palatable, but how can I make it go down better so I get enough calories? And I realized that if I put fruit cocktail on it, the soggy syrup would make it just so I could chew it up and down it quicker. So I would put fruit cocktail, like from that can, the big industrial fruit cocktail that you might like as a kid, but no one who's an adult would eat willingly. Uh, and later I realized that I, if I wanted to drink coffee anyway, then why not just put it in my coffee uh, and make it even quicker? And that's not good either. <laughs> and then lunch might be that salad sandwich that I described with, if there was some, you know, some white rice that they didn't have butter in and I put that on it too. Does that taste good? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it tastes like something you would eat on a plane if you forgot to ask for the vegan option and now you're stuck, you know, on a 10 hour flight, you know, so so that's how the, the basic training was. I, did I make it through? Yes. Did I enjoy the food? No. Uh, could I have done it differently? I don't, I don't think so. Probably not. I, I think it would have been like that really no matter what I did. I could have made a gigantic stink about it, but I don't think at that point, at 2003, most people didn't know what a vegan was. If I went uh, to the dining facility manager and talked about it, I don't think that would work. Now where America is with the vegan thing, I think that it would, I would probably go farther with it. And um, I think we're about 10 years out from it being much, much easier. I think as, as things evolve, like the Israeli army and in, in, in England, it's super easy to be vegan in the military, or at least it's, it's easier than it is here. <laughs> a rice and lettuce sandwich i mean <laughs> don't re i don't recommend it i don't recommend it no. if you know i think there's when so when i give talks and i guess you listen to, to one of mine there's two things that i like to do in the talk i i do like to mention a little bit of like what it was like back in the day to be vegan but i also like to make sure that people don't leave with that as an idea because the reason why i mentioned the what it was like to be vegan is, okay, here's, an, here's a situation that's difficult. Here's what I did. I made it through it. You can too. But I don't want to like conflate that with vegan equals eating a rice sandwich uh, because it's not. Like being vegan means, you know, God, there's so many different vegan options these days. Uh, and there's so many vegan restaurants. Uh, and we were t talking earlier about that bakery or multiple bakeries, the m many regular regular restaurants that have vegan stuff, supermarkets and whatever that it shouldn't be difficult at all. So I don't want to leave listeners with the, uh, if you go vegan, you're going to be eating cornflakes, uh, you know, dry for breakfast, except if you do listen to this and for some crazy reason, you're like, Oh, I want to go in the military. Then through basic training, some basic trainings, if you still go through bending, it might be like that, but I know some dining facilities now they are, they have soy milk, they have silk. Some of them even have different different alternatives to that. Uh, it, yeah, it's going to be much different. Well, it's important that you're going through a very strenuous time. That you need to you need nutrients yeah. to get through it. I mean, cornflakes and coffee and cornflakes with fruit cocktail sugary syrup with maraschino cherries which are the best part right so it, that's the only good part <laughs> but i mean still your energy had to just fall i would say i didn't feel good through it i was probably doing i mean we were awake 20 hours a day and i was doing that on 1500 calories on a good day uh like you know i the, what you would like you would guess i didn't go in you know, overweight, but I left, lost 20 pounds. Uh, yeah. and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a 20 pounds that I wanted to spare. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you get through it and sometimes things like that, uh, happen for a reason. I don't, I don't know if I cosmically believe everything happens for a reason. That sounds like some mumbo jumbo, but in that case it, I, well, I mean, 
if anyone was going to go through it, it might as well have been me. I'd been vegan for 10 years before that. So, and I'd been vegan and, you know, I went to kickboxed in Thailand or whatever. So I had already gone through similarly unpleasant things. So uh, it was just basically like getting back into that mindset of like, okay, this is life now, accept it. And I then mean, once I did, it was like, okay. Right. I mean, you made a decision to do something and your, your motivation for that decision was nine eleven. So you were going yeah. to, you were going to do good no matter what. No matter what. Yeah. And that, I mean, and you're right. <laughs> People, if you're watching this, we don't eat rice on bread. <laughs> no, I don't recommend it. I don't <laughs> recommend it. It's, I mean, that's like, like if you're at the hotel for the breakfast the next day and you're starving type food and you have no way to get someplace else in that moment, even though you're at a hotel, that's your, that's your situation. I mean, you can always make something from somewhere. You know, like I said, you can always get bread. You can always get fruit and and vegetables somehow ish right eat a banana or whatever yeah we could probably have a, a whole episode on unfortunate things vegans have had to eat uh and i could i could name a bunch i was at a funeral once where i i ate a broccoli sandwich the sandwich <laughs> was two pieces of bread and broccoli because they had bread they had broccoli and that was it i mean everything else was like i'm sure they spent it wasn't that they were trying to do the funeral send off luncheon, you know, disrespectfully. They had a whole bunch of food, but it was all that, you know, old timey stuff that uh, none of us are going to be able to eat. You know, it like an ambrosia pudding stuff with marshmallows, <laughs> and, you know, that kind of that kind of flavor. So a broccoli sandwich, I guess I should have been grateful for it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't even think there was a condiment on it. I think it was just broccoli and bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. why when some some people will occasionally ask me hey did any of your friends while you were in the military go vegan i was like i mean not really if you see some dude eating a broccoli sandwich or a rice sandwich you're not going to be like let me get on that yeah, i mean <laughs> maybe now if you see like someone being healthy and see you know you see some videos of me going to like japan and eating ramen in some awesome place you're like oh hey vegan is pretty cool but uh broccoli sandwiches are not going to not gonna do it. No, <laughs> and that and that's not military. That's just like real. No, world. that was just that's that just, was just the nineties, right? I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people have been on that have been being in for a very long time, and we talk about you know powdered soy milk. Well, and like we already brought up, already brought up tofu, which you know uh, it still exists. Has, but <laughs> has anyone brought up Nature Burger? Nature Burger. They haven't brought it up, but I'm I I the Nature Burgers. Is there a green one? Nature Burger was the worst. I believe it was Fantastic Foods. And if Fantastic Foods, if it was you and if you're still around, you should be ashamed of yourself. That was the worst. <laughs> Nature Burger. Somebody sent it to me while I was in Afghanistan, and I actually I actually I think I threw it away. Because Nature Burger was basically and, and I'm making this up, but it had the mouth taste. It had the taste and mouth feel of if you go into your, your, like, your garden and you have like a little shovel and you just get some <laughs> like dirt and twigs and like maybe a rock or two, and then you mix it up with some water and you fry it. That's what nature burger tastes like. Uh, I'm sure I'll get some hate from that, but if you've had it, you know that's that's what it tastes like. Let's let's not lie. And you can put ketchup on it. But yeah, I mean you could you could put ketchup on a, a cup and eat this cup. It would still taste like ketchupy. <laughs> that's fantastic. There's a lot of there's food has definitely gotten it has definitely improved. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I mean it's incredible. That was to be fair to fantastic foods, they were a pioneer. Uh, this is easily seven years before Boca Burgers, okay. maybe okay. maybe even a decade before Boca Burgers, there, uh, there was not, I mean, the only thing other than that would have been some kind of weird concoctee of tofu that you did yourself. Like, so, I mean, giving, giving fantastic foods or nature burger, they're just due, like the first car wasn't really a car, you know? <laughs> so, you know, they didn't, 
Beyond didn't just come out the gate with like, oh, okay, we, we, there was nothing. Now it's beyond, you know, beyond meat or impossible burger. No. Uh, yes, I've been accused of eating <laughs> sticks and twigs before. So I actually have a story about that. So <laughs> after the military, after, so after I was active duty, I actually got out of active duty service to open my own vegan restaurant. And I went to a vegan culinary uh, program in, Lancaster, California, and it was a great program, but this was around the, the downturn of the economy in 2008, I was gonna open, and that wouldn't have been a good time to open anything, except maybe like loan forgiveness uh, business, <laughs> something like that. Like, that was a very bad time. Yes. Uh, and I realized that it was not a great time uh, to be doing any of that stuff. So what did I do? I ended up going back in the reserves and I then started taking classes to become an RN, which as a medic transferring to be in an RN, it was a very, you know, very easy transition. Reason why I bring it up is I was on an FTX, a field training exercise where we're out in the middle of nowhere and there, and one of the guys goes, doc, and that's what they call a medic. And he goes, doc, what, what are you going to eat? I know you're a vegan. And, uh, I pulled out my knife I went out and I started cutting off some like some branches and I pulled up some twigs and then the, some guys crowded around and watched me like, like, what's he going to do? Like, and I got this whole little pile together and they're like, and then I was like, ah, no, nah, I'm just kidding. And I pulled out some ramen and op opened up a <laughs> stove and started making ramen. But uh, people are like, whoa, is that really what vegans eat? Like, you're like, no idiot. Like, uh, yeah, but yeah. And actually, since I'm mentioning that, and I don't recommend doing this, but this is the kind of stuff, this is kind of where this concept of starting vegan came along. When uh, my, I had a pretty good PT score, it was never perfect, but it was usually around a 298 or 299 out of 300. Uh, I always, I was good with the run, but not great. But as I would do, we were doing PT tests, I would often run by someone, run up to them, and then like, talk some smack or say like, you know, the reason why you're not doing great is because you're still eating animals and <laughs> you're a vegan and you'd be able to do this. And I would run way ahead of them. Uh, yeah, it was kind of fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Actually, you should have been like, now we're going to light a fire. <laughs> this thing's and drinks. Right now I'm going to cook my ramen. <laughs> nope. That's so funny. So going back, you, you touched on being in Afghanistan. And yes, I know that was the hardest place to eat for you but uh, it was actually basic training was actually worse okay <laughs> because basic training you know limited time limited uh i guess power uh when i was in afghanistan i was a sergeant and that's actually where sergeant vegan came from like it sounds sergeant vegan sounds like a stage name and i guess it is but i was a sergeant in the military with all of the good and the bad that comes from that. And that as a platoon medic, as, as an E5, I was pretty much able to just do whatever, like as within reason of I wanted, like I, I went into the chow hall pretty much when, you know, when I wasn't doing something job related, like wrapping somebody up or doing whatever I would go, you know, but there was usually not much there. I, there was a website at the time called any soldier.com, which was basically sending what we would call pogey bait, which is like snacks and, you know, Maxim magazines and, and smokes <laughs> to, uh, to soldiers and stuff. And I put on that website that one of my soldiers was vegan, you know, and then I alluded that it was me and people just, people's minds exploded that they thought the idea that somebody would voluntarily go to war and stay vegan while doing it, it was just like, mind explosion kind of stuff. I mean, and a lot of people that sent me stuff weren't vegan. They just respected that anyone would be, and you could even say like, tell it as it is, it would, that anyone would be as ridiculous as that to do that. And I mean, yeah, so I toured at, in the, in the beginning when I first w went to Afghanistan, I knew that it was going to be a little bit rough. So just based on how it was in basic training and, and other training. So I was like, Hmm, I'm going to think outside the box. I'm literally going to send myself boxes of stuff. So I, I put, I had these industrial size boxes. I knew where I was going. Cause, uh, 
we were, I was attached to uh, field artillery. So, and that wasn't really going to be super mobile. And they said, okay, you're going to be more or less in this spot, at least for a month or two. So I was like, straight, I'm going to send myself 150 pounds of food. So I put all this stuff in these gigantic boxes, uh, every ramen, soy milk, uh, cliff bars, everything that existed. If it was vegan technology in 2003, I knew where to find it. I found it and I put it in this as long as it wasn't perishable. Get, sent that all to my stuff, uh, self. So when we got in the in country, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I got enough food to last me, I mean, maybe six months of deployment, 150 pounds of food. This is awesome. Uh, they gave us a safety brief. And the first thing that they said was, uh, Doc, bad news. One of your boxes exploded. And I'm like, uh, exploded like that with the hand <laughs> gesture. And uh, yes, it exploded. So not only did I not have all that food, I had like less than one box. Uh, every time we got attacked, people would do the exploded. Was there an explosion? <laughs> uh, which, to be fair, is pretty funny because I said it in like, I didn't just say like exploded or use some tough guy voice. Like I just said, exploded and people thought that was pretty funny and i guess it was funny but at the moment i was like uh-oh what do i do record skip i'm in trouble and then luckily uh any soldier.com saved me and tofurky uh i also have to give them uh a, yet another shout out because when someone when tofurky found out that i was sponsored and or sponsored when i found they found out that i was there they sponsored me and sent me stuff and i got a picture uh, you know, that back in the day, Tofurky was doing some like send a picture with Tofurky in the most remote spot. And I think I think I was definitely a contender for the world champion having a uh, Tofurky in Afghanistan in a war zone with a, a 105 Mike Mike Howitzer behind me. <laughs> well, that's, you know, in that moment, you're like, not only is it explosion, but it's like, I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, starving. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. How long did it take for you to get food? I mean, what did you do in that interim? So, I mean, there was a chow hall. I mean, there was a dining facility. If you buy a dining facility, it was like a 20, 20 by 10 plywood box <laughs> that somebody made. And, and there were cooks. If by cooks, you mean like three Marines who they were like infantrymen and they're like, Hey, you, now you're a cook, open these tin cans and like heat it up. So, None of that stuff was vegan. I mean, they did have bread. So probably the first, in the beginning, it was probably just peanut butter and jelly, probably as much as I wanted, but there's only so much you can want of a PBJ, you know? And then, you know, bagels, sometimes fresh, sometimes stale, usually by fresh, I mean frozen and then to thawed. Uh, I mean, there's only so much of that you can eat until your body is just like, we don't really need to eat at the moment, not out of hunger, just out of like, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. So it looked like it was going to be, I mean, on top of the normal, uh, oh no, I'm at war. It'd be the oh, a full year of this. But, you know, as things turned out, it, it you know, luckily, anysoldier.com, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate it. And Tofurky, I mean, they sent me I mean, 12 boxes of shelf stable jerky and stuff like that. I, it, it was, it was nice. They, they, they definitely helped me out. Yeah. That's the Seth is fantastic in regards to his company still to this day. Uh, oh yeah. They're, they're, and they're, they're there. wonderful people yep. talking about people doing it for the right reasons. I mean, a lot of, a lot of companies people have noted and rightfully so uh, make plant-based or vegan products because there's money in it. You know, I get it. I, I mean, I, I'm not against capitalism when it helps, you know, the world and helps vegans and helps obviously the animals, you know, but at the same point, you are just giving someone money so they can make money in the end. But it's nice when a company like that doing it for the right reasons down for the cause, you know, is able to stay afloat without screwing people over. I, I, you know, I got to like that. Yeah. So being vegan, being in the military, how did, how did you align those things? So thank you. That's, I wouldn't say it's, there's many ways to answer that. Uh, and 
it just was. Uh, you know, uh, I, I often joked the the motto, the army motto while I was in the army was army of one. And when people would ask me about being vegan, I'd say like, oh, this army of one's vegan, dude. And just leave it at that. I guess I looked at it at, so originally I looked at it at, as the, re, the main reason why I joined was greater good to be able to serve. And I had thought about serving before when I had first gone into college, but I went vegan my first year of college. And at that point, wearing leather combat boots was a deal breaker. Um, after we were attacked and it, if you, if people could remember back uh, to what it was like in right after 9-11, it kind of felt like the world was crumbling. And, you know, obviously I wouldn't be buying leather boots. I would just be issued them. The idea of uh, not helping out in our time of need because I, I didn't feel like putting uh, leather boots on my feet uh, just sounded a little silly in some ways. Obviously, you could definitely expand that into veganism is about nonviolence. You're, you'd be working or supporting the worst organization in the world, if, and some people could frame it like that. But politically, uh, uh, not even to get into politics, but I've always been kind of a, well, I guess in, in college, I was a sociology major, so you could guess where I was with that. But I often saw the military, and even so, more so now, as just an extension of whatever the, your country's doing. So if a country decides to do something, the military does it. It's not like the military you know, is deciding to go to war or deciding to do these things. It's just you know, kind of the way it is. So you know, in, in a situation where a country didn't go to war, the military would basically just be sitting around. You'd be playing video games and training. Uh, so as far as it being part of a worse system. I mean, if you're a member of the country, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, you could go in the middle of the ocean and start your own country. I believe they've made a movie or two about that. Uh, but otherwise, you're kind of supporting a country with your taxes or with what it's doing. Uh, as far as Afghanistan goes and my time in the military, I, I think I was able to eke out a greater good, be able to do more good than bad. Uh, be able to help more more people than we uh, than we sent to their maker. You know, I, I feel like I was able to kind of even the scales out. And now that I'm using leveraging the, the, my time in the military to be able to talk to more people about being vegan, I think it's it's tipped more to the it's 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 been a better bet as a as a medic. You know, as you would guess, my main job wasn't to take people's lives because if it's come down to the medic. Uh, taking people's lives, you know, things have really gone south. I, I spent more time uh, at a clinic for locals, wrapping up burnt babies who had fallen in a kitchen fire or, uh, you know, people have been stabbed up by their neighbor or whatever. The, the people that I knew while I was in Afghanistan were the locals, even the people that didn't like us, uh, weren't bad people. It was just a bad situation. And uh, we would often joke that, like, you know, people have nothing better to do there than, than to hurt each other because there's no TV. And I, you could say the same thing. I guess you could extend that to Netflix. If they just had Netflix, they would probably be sitting at home watching Netflix. But with no TV and no entertainment, what are you going to do? I mean, the, the, those, the people there, unfortunately, seem to spend more time killing each other. Uh, I mean, luckily for us, they spent more time killing each other than fighting us. We just were there, like there'd be back and forth, and then uh, somebody would show up all shot up. Or um, I guess if we're going to talk, mention stuff like that, that just the way with Sharia law and the Taliban and stuff like that, it, um, and gender equality and whatnot. Uh, I remember one of the first things I did while I was in country is a, a woman came in, her uh, husband decided that instead of just going through the hassle of divorcing her, he would hit her in the head with an ax. Uh, so we uh, spent some time like sewing up her head and, and that. So that's, that was kind of the culture we were living in. Uh, I, I don't think it's that it, those people were inherently bad or wrong. It's just when you're put in situations, you do what's in normal in that situation. But uh, except that, yeah, I would, 
I would go as far as to say, no matter what the situation, hitting someone in the head with an axe is, is wrong. Yeah, it's no bueno. No. And, and, and that's, like you said, different culture, different world, different rules. But that's still wrong. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. So I do, I do like, let's go to a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the story you shared in Atlanta with your brother. So I shared a story with uh, those who were at the Atlanta Veg Fest, and it's actually in my book, Vegan Strong, as well. I did an interview with my brother, who's been vegan 27 years, almost as long as me, but uh, he, he kind of watched me for a while, made sure I didn't die before he was going to jump on board. But it was still the 90s. So the story he mentions, and he has a, a point to segue to it, uh, and I, I thought it was very poignant, and I also made sure that I, I, I share the story as a reason to bring, to talk about this point. So my brother, my brother and I live near this Chinese restaurant and I can't remember the name of it and it's really unimportant, but they had a Mabo Dufu. And for those who might think of Chinese restaurants now, especially most of them are going to have some kind of vegan options that are incredible, like vegan general sows or orange chicken or whatever like that. Back then, there was none of that. So the closest to that we would have in the early 90s would have been mabal tofu, which is like sweet and spicy tofu. But if you put that over rice, you know, I don't, I don't hate some mabal tofu. But the original, they would, I would often come with some chicken. Uh, and that's the way it was, you know, mabal tofu with, with chicken. So my brother asked for mabal tofu without chicken. And they said, sure, no chicken. He's, and he ch checked a couple times. Make sure you don't cook it with the chicken, just the, you know, the mabo dofu sauce and the tofu, please. No chicken. You know, they went back and forth a bunch. Totally fine. My brother brought it home. He was eating it. What's this? It's some chicken. He goes back and he's like, hey, that mabo dofu had chicken. They're like, nope, no chicken. He's like, what's that? They're like, oh, yeah, it's chicken. <laughs> so... My brother doing, because we, I wouldn't say we were brainwashed, but our idea of, of eating animals was that it was not food, it was poison, which, I mean, I agree, but he took that logic and he said, okay, if I was going to eat poison, what would I do? Probably the CDC would say, drink some Epicac, which is a syrup that makes you purge your, 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 your entrails. So he drank this Epicac and he vomited for, I don't know, I would say probably the entire day. He spent the entire day puking because that was the right thing to do by the way we looked at it. I see where his logic brought him to, but I don't know if that is positive or if that is the, as how we need to talk about veganism to people. I think if instead of talking to people in those kind of like terms where it makes it sound very like sensationalized and dramatic and as a uh, meat eaters who are watching this are going to think I just ate a burger. It was a hamburger. I didn't die. I could eat a burger tomorrow. I'm also not going to get die, die or get sick. That's not true. It's not poison. So, the fact that people could go back and forth to this. And then when we say poison, we don't mean like literally you're going to die. Like, uh, like this is some kind of a poison from a rattlesnake bite, or this is, uh, some like lethal poison. It's like a gradual going to kill you. And by your time, you're like 70 <laughs> of like heart disease. And then they say they're going to come back with, Oh, it's, you mean just unhealthy. So, I, as much as I love to think of talking to people about eating meat as poison, like the CDC just came out that meat is a carcinogen. It's this straight up as a link to cancer. I think when, if we use the word poison to talk about it, you know, just like we would, um, you know, arsenic, it's, it's clearly not as, as true as to say it's a, it's a less than optimal diet, both for yourself and for the planet, and obviously for the animals. That has a more ring of truth to it. It doesn't sound as cool and it doesn't look as good as in a meme, but I think 
lying to people is never going to be bring people around and over sensationalized and using like really cool sound bites when it's not true. I don't, I think it has a smack of like being disingenuous, but if we tell people the truth as it actually is now, even then people aren't often going to come around, but at least we've done, done things the right way. Yeah. No, I agree. It's just, it's, it's just crazy that he, he, threw, <laughs> he, he, he threw that up. I mean, I, I have, I have friends that have said, oh, I ate meat by mistake. Do I start my clock over of how long I've been vegan? And I, I mean, like, no. Cl <laughs> clock of what? Like, <laughs> clock of what? Like, I, I think we got to look at this as why we're doing this. If we're doing this for the animals, uh, starting your clock over hasn't helped the animals more. They're not going to be like, oh, thank you. We were being killed and, and we were suffering. But now that you've started your clock over, <laughs> every, everything is great. You know, uh, I, I think there just has to be, I think people just need to, people and, and the movement in general has to think of it more of why are we doing this? Like, is this more just because we want to get more likes on, on Instagram or Facebook, or we want to be able to pat ourselves on the back better? Uh, or are we actually really interested in engaging with people and having people think about it and then say like, okay, maybe I'll take it, you know, try a healthier option every now and again. I, I think that's going to be better overall than just trying to promote veganism among, among, among vegans. What does that do? <laughs> like, I just, I, I wonder about it sometimes. Like, and granted, I acknowledge that, yes, I'm a, a dude who writes um, primarily currently vegan books. And yes, I enjoy traveling around the planet eating vegan food. And yes, I, I, I do do uh, podcasts and interviews and talk about vegan stuff. So I guess I'm lumped in with people who do this. But the idea of a vegan celebrity of people who, you know, there's a lot of people like that. And unfortunately, I guess I'm, I'm one of them too, that aren't necessarily celebrities, but you're just on social media and you talk about this stuff. Uh, I guess my feeling would be, be your own hero, be your own vegan celebrity. You know, just because this person has like X amount of followers doesn't mean their words are any more important than what yours were, especially there's a lot of people I know who have been vegan for decades and they're not a celebrity. They've just been someone who's been actually living it. And then there's, you know, these people who go back and forth on YouTube. They were vegan. Now they're not. You know, uh, none of the stuff that they do or say really matters. I mean, you could probably lump me in there too, I guess. And, and uh, if you if feel free. But the more most important thing is what people do themselves and what people are taking from it and how they're living. And I think the the other thing about the uh, the Epicac incident is that anytime we, we promote veganism as not being a fun, joyous thing that kind of rules, uh, you make it into a crusade and no one wants to be around martyrs or crusaders. Like it's just annoying and it kind of sucks. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I think we should definitely consider how we pr promote veganism. Uh, the, the, you know, the vegans attacking vegans on social media, I, it, that kind of stuff, uh, or the people trying to make money from it, like donate to my this, that, or the other so I can save animals when they're clearly uh, just vacationing on the money. Like, like <laughs> I've, I've seen a whole bunch of, of nonsense, but to be fair, like why were, you, why were people doing this hero worshiping in the first place? I, I guess people need someone to believe in. I just, I mean, from my background, from the punk rock scene, I believe in me. That's it. Like, you do you. Uh, if you turn out to be, like, uh, awesome, great. If you turn out to be a fake and a flake, I've, I've lost nothing. So. Well, what you said was, for people who know what you're talking about, loaded. Yeah. <laughs> right? For people who don't great advice so i mean thank you for sharing and thank you for doing it in a very diplomatic way and touching on things that i'm aware of <laughs> so i i appreciate it you're right you know hey well that's that's my opinion too and people can 
the thing with opinions is most people have one. Oh, I, I just. Yeah, you just cut it. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a funny, that was a funny freeze. Uh, the thing with opinions, everyone has one. If you've been vegan, I, I think in a lot of ways too, uh, speaking of this uh, kind of like vegan celebrity crap, uh, yes, I feel like as someone who's been vegan for decades, I might know a little, I would hope I know more about it than someone who's been vegan a year. But, you know, after you've been doing this for three plus years, you know, you kind of know probably most there is to know. And I think... There was at first a feeling, especially me with me and people who've probably been vegan, you know, as the same amount or a little or or, or longer, that uh, you know, it there is just a, there was just a difference between uh, activists like us and people that had been just vegan, like you know, in a couple of years, like you know, even since diet cheese has been around or whatever. <laughs> but in a way, I think that's that's not a bad thing that they never had to go through that. And that their whole experience of being vegan is different. And, but different, not in a bad way. Like when I think of vegan, there's so much baggage to it. And when someone else thinks of uh, who's been only vegan a couple of years, but it's only been easy and cush, you know, that's not a bad thing either that they're going to be able to say like, how, what are you talking about? Vegan is difficult. Like veggie grill, like I have cheese on my pizza, like this, that, the other. Whereas, you know, legitimately the the first 10 years i was vegan you know it was basically like oh i wanted to eat ice cream i got soy milk i put you know chocolate syrup in it i stirred it up and i put it in the refrigerator or the freezer and then when it froze i ate it and i was like yum yum chocolate ice cream that sucks nobody is going to argue otherwise that that didn't suck and if someone saw me eating that that chocolate sludge, they would not be like, you know what? I was eating this uh, exploited cow ice cream, but now that I've eaten <laughs> seen you eating that sludge with that grumpy look on your face, I want to be. I want to never eat dairy products again. No. So I think this next generation who has never had to put up with the stuff that I have had has an advantage in a way in that. There's no baggage to it. Vegan is only what it is now, which is super easy, super delicious, and none of those uh, goofy, goofy war stories that, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel like that could be a podcast name, Vegan War Stories. That probably yeah, definitely could be, <laughs> definitely could be a podcast name. That people have a lot of them. So that's, that's awesome. I want you to touch on the books because you have sure, a new one. Sure, sure, sure. Right? Uh, Actually, give me one second. I'm going to grab them. They're right over to my side. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, Susan, for all the comments. I don't want you to think I'm ignoring you. <laughs> so um, the first is Vegan Strong, yep. which uh, I call a field manual for being vegan because it basically is field manual. It's uh, I wanted to make a vegan book, a vegan guide on how to be vegan, but I wanted to make it the least hippie take on being vegan that I'd ever seen. And the title Vegan Strong came from the army motto or the army slogan, or I guess you would say a promotional campaign. When I was in the reserves, they called it army strong. And I think that's because they were trying to get more people in. Everybody like me who had already gone in for 9-11 had already done multiple tours was exhausted and they tried to like put a, a new face, kind of jazz it up. And I think that's where they came up with Army Strong. And they probably ganked that from Live Strong. Uh, so uh, in 2014, when I started writing Vegan Strong, I was like, how do I, how do I make vegan seem like less hippie and more appealing to people who should go vegan for their health or for the planet? But because of the the countless numbers of like, you know, I, I can't I keep going back to calling them hippies, but that perception, that negative perception that that still persists to this day in the media, in on TV and whatever. And I thought, you know what? I'll kind of make it look like a field manual, like an army field manual when I was in the military. Nothing less uh there is nothing less hippie than being in the military, number one. Number two. Uh, I'll, I'll put camo on it. 
I'll, I'll call it a uh, vegan strong. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, that says uh, like not hippie and not weak other than putting strong on it. And, uh, you know, even on the back, there's a picture of me in Afghanistan. It's like very specifically that. And a, a guidebook, well, my idea was a guidebook, all the things that I would want to know if I was just going vegan as a, at, I went vegetarian at 18. So like if I could go back in time and hand something to myself, like, a, a, like all the tips and training and food and recipes and whatever. And that's what the book is. Um, after all those unfortunate school shootings and and mass shootings, they started using strong after every single place that they had something like that. So I wouldn't think now that the army will want to go after me because they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to look at uh, you know Sandy Hook and all those places who have used something strong after their name. But at the time, I was really thinking like, wow, is uh, Uncle Scam going to be uh, gunning for me for this? But luckily not. <laughs> And that's vegan strong, and it's it's on Amazon. The uh, the other one is I just wrote a children's book, The Adventures of Sergeant Piggy. And the reason why I I wanted to do a children's book is I had seen a few children's books, and they were they were cute and all, but they were also a little bit on the weepy side. And I wanted to make a book that was not weepy, but fun, talking about adventure, had a little bit of the vegan theme in there, but in a positive way, because being vegan is not a burden. Being vegan does not mean, ooh, I can't eat anything, woe is me, I'm a martyr. No, being vegan is awesome. And I wanted to have kids, whether their parents are raising them vegetarian or vegan, and then they want to have a little bit of those things sprinkled in there, or maybe you wanted to give a, a book to your friend of the family and you, you were like, if I got to buy him a book anyway, it'd be kind of nice if there was something about the environment, something about not eating animals. Cause I have that, I have a, a couple pages where I specifically mention it, that Sergeant Piggy doesn't eat animals because they're, they're his friends, but I wanted to make the majority of it seem very like, you know, patriotic and like, huh, America, but also like, Hey, save the planet. Don't eat the animals, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, I partnered with a great artist, uh, Hayden Fowler did the art. Uh, I, in no way, shape or form can I draw. Uh, my art is more conceptual, I, I can think of things, I'm an author, but as far as uh, I can I can do a smiley face and that's about it. Uh, I have to uh, rely on other people's great artistic talent. <laughs> well, that's that's amazing because how well, how, the, how the sales are good i mean that's sales are good so far um also available on amazon by the way if you're interested da, da, da. Yep. yeah it's been pretty good now i would prefer to be actively doing veg fest and talking to people in person and i was uh after i'd released vegan strong i'd gone on a multiple state tour where i was on tv talking about it and stuff like that Obviously, when you do that, things are better. Uh, I mean, as far as uh, sales go in a pandemic when you can't actively advertise, I mean, yeah, I guess things are good. Once our pandemic is over, or at least to a point where we have events again, I'll get back to it and uh, you'll be able to get either of these books or uh, I'm, I'm working on a third book and that, that'll be probably out next year or the year after that, so... Okay. Excited about too. Oh, that's awesome. Thank <laughs> you. Really. So if people wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? So the easiest way is through my website, sergeantvegan.com. That's sgtvegan.com. Sgtvegan, like the, the name tag. The other way is, as you can see down here, uh, on, I'm on the, the gram as sgt underscore vegan and sgt uh, space vegan on Facebook. Why people sometimes ask why SGT? That's that's uh, short for sergeant with in the military sergeant. Yeah. Yep. Because you're a sergeant vegan. Because <laughs> I was. Because I'm sergeant well, that, vegan. Yeah. That's who you are. <laughs> that's why your name is that on your yeah. social media, which totally makes sense. Well, I thank you, thank you for joining me today. This was as fun as I thought it was going to be. And you have a lot to say and share and experiences and people need to know that I have friends that are 
military that are vegan, they go with food. It has gotten better, but they still bring oh, yeah. food with them. So, We're eventually, eventually there's going to be an all vegan MRE. We're going to make it happen. I haven't fully started whatever ramp up I need to do about it, but I mean, all I've done is just mention it to people like, this is something that we always should have had. They are, there are vegetarian MREs like in every box. They're just not vegan. But if we, my, my pitch is if we had like, you could call it the picky eaters MRE meals ready to eat those, those yeah. meals that we get. But if you had like a, a halal kosher, gluten-free vegan, whatever kind of, you know, it would obviously be dairy free because it's vegan. Like it could basically be a couple packets of gruel. Like, I don't think people would care. Like it would be better if it tasted good because then, then <laughs> other soldiers would eat it too. But if you just had a picky eaters MRE in, in every box, uh, I mean, there's usually not, you know, there's usually not more than one vegan in any company, let alone in just a small group. Uh, I don't think it would ever be an issue. And they would really enjoy having it. Right. And if it's good, starving. everyone's going to eat it. That's the only problem with having limited amount. Oh, look, oh, that looks good. Oh, that smells good. Oh, I'll take that. But wait, wait, that's the only thing I can eat. You can just eat your food. <laughs> I did encounter a little bit of that, but I mean, really only a little bit of it. And uh, generally speaking, my own personal experience was people would always throw me the you know, the, the vegan thing, because they were, you know, as the medic, they knew my sole purpose in life was to save their lives. So you're not going to make the one person who has a vested interest in keeping you alive angry, you know, <laughs> or hungry, <laughs> yeah, or hungry. I mean, uh, yeah, I got the shakes. I'm so hungry. <laughs> it's Stitch happened. me up right now. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bill. Really, I appreciate you. I look forward to having you at events when I can have them. And I mean, I'm going to have them, but I'm just not doing an education component yet until I can feel comfortable with people sitting by one another. But yeah. when we do, but definitely if there's more virtual stuff, I'm hitting you up. <laughs> thank you. And uh, especially uh, if you did a panel or something like that, I, I, I like a panel. I don't feel the need to be the only person talking because it's fun to be able to, you know, go back and forth uh, or stuff like that too. So yeah, don't want no, to nobody medic. wants a hangry <laughs> medic. No, nobody wants a hangry medic. No. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. I'll think about a panel. If you have any ideas for a panel, let me know. And you know, I can find the other people and put it together. Exactly. I'll give it a think. All right. Thank you. Well, have a great rest of your day. You're in California, so you've got time. And on my end, I'm just going to work on heavy dinner. But cool. thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Right, Thanks for having me. No problem. Bye. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching another episode of Virtual Veg Fest Live. That was so much fun. I'm really glad that Bill came on. We have another talk on Sunday this week, not Saturday. Carrie LeBlanc, Las Vegas or the Vegas Veg Fest organizer will be here. And she is also Compassion Works International. That's her nonprofit. She saves elephants, just so you know. Let's see. Wear a mask over your nose, under your chin. Make sure your mask is on correctly. And if you're not following the news, a little tidbit, two masks, N95, KN95 mask really important right now double up with your cotton mask over that because there's some really contagious covid viruses floating around our country so they're saying that we need to i would like to be in a panel sometime christine send me a message so make sure you wear your mask correctly if you don't cover your nose you're not doing anything you have to cover your nose right and if you have the means and the ability to order takeout, curbside pickup, food trucks from all your vegan friendly or vegan restaurants, plant-based restaurants, please do so. Why? They need to survive this. And one of the best ways that we can support them is to order food. Like I said, if you have the means to do that, please do. So thank you for watching. Thanks for again. My dogs are scratching at the door. <laughs> they don't like being away. But thank you. I'll see you on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And have a great Thursday, rest of your Thursday. Bye.